My name is Alexander Dang, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the bipartisan mission of the Dole Institute. Members of the SAB receive many great opportunities. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. If at any time the program, during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. And now, please welcome Associate Director of the Dole Institute, Dr. Barbara Bally. Thank you, Alexander. I will say to you, good evening and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and tonight's program, The National Security Advisor with Don Gregg. I am Barbara Ballard, I'm the Associate Director here at the Dole Institute of Politics. Tonight's interview will be conducted by Dole Institute Director Bill Lacey. The Dole Institute would like to extend a special thanks to Stuart Thorson, the Maxwell School's Donald P. and Margaret Curry Gregg Professor at Syracuse University for arranging the appearance of tonight's guest. Stu, would you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> Thank you. Our guest tonight has spent over 60 years working in global affairs, including over 40 years working for the United States government. He was a 31-year veteran of the Central Intelligence Agency, spending time in Japan, Burma, Vietnam, and Korea. Beginning in 1979, he served as an advisor on the National Security Council. From 1982 until 1989, he was the National Security Advisor to Vice President George H.W. Bush. He was then appointed U.S. Ambassador to South Korea, a post he held until 1993. He is currently the Chairman Emeritus of the Korea Society and the Chairman of the Pacific Century Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Don Gregg. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to the Dole Institute. It's great to have you here tonight. Delighted to be here, thank you. Wonderful. Let's start off, uh, we usually do this with all of our guests uh, from public service. Talk a little bit about your upbringing and your education and how you got started in, in diplomacy and national security. Uh, well, I'm an only child. Uh, my father was head of uh, boys work in the National Council of the YMCA and was very much involved in starting something called the Indian Guides, which I hope some of you knew about. Uh, he met my mother in Colorado Springs when he came back from World War I. Uh, she was Dean of Women at Colorado College and she was very much interested in the YWCA. Uh, I was born and raised in Hastings on Hudson, New York, about 20 miles north of New York City. I contracted tuberculosis when I was seven. I uh, went out to Colorado, didn't go to school until I was 12. I uh, was very limited in my physical and sports activity until 14 or 15. Uh, I enlisted in the Army at 17 as soon as I graduated from college was trained as a crypt analyst, uh, which caused NSA to approach me after I graduated from college, asking if I'd like to join NSA. My answer was no. And the man said, well, you ought to join, consider joining CIA. And I said, well, what's CIA? And he very cynically said, oh, they jump out of airplanes and are going to save the world. And I said, sign me up. <laughs> so, uh, I went to Williams College, uh, graduated in 1951, uh, majored in philosophy, and uh, I still teach a winter study course there, uh, four weeks in January, something which I really consider the high point of my life. So, uh, as I said before, I sort of think of myself as an intelligence officer because that's where I've spent most of my life. 
but I'm very interested in teaching. I'm extremely impressed by the atmosphere here at Lawrence and just am delighted to be with you. Wonderful. Could you tell us a little bit about, uh, and I realize some of this may be, um, may still be classified, but could you tell us some things that are unclassified highlights of your career in the CIA? A few of the things that you found most interesting? Uh, the issue of breaking the rules. Uh, it's something that uh, I try to get into conversations with uh, young people. And uh, one place not to do it is West Point. Uh, uh, West Point has become a tremendously impressive liberal arts college. And uh, I got into my talking about breaking the rules there. And uh, hawk faced upperclassman said, uh, I don't think I'd have the guts to do what you did. You risked everything. And uh, I said, well, I wish you luck along the way. And we shook hands, and he walked away shaking his head. And I've never been back, invited back. <laughs> and I understand why. Because uh, this business of breaking the rules is, is very, very sensitive. I got away with it uh, because I worked with CIA. And CIA is an, an an analogy in a free society. Uh, you're given the authority to break certain rules. And so the, the limits and the boundaries that you deal with are very different. And it gives scope to men and women who set much lower limits or higher boundaries than, than I. Uh, and so I chose a, a time when I was chief of station in South Korea to uh, absolutely break the rules. And that came about uh, when I was chief of station there. And the leading opposition politician in South Korea, Kim Dae-jung, was kidnapped. Uh, and Phil Habib, the magnificent ambassador, called me in and said, I know how things work around here. They're going to kill him. But if you can tell me who has him by tomorrow morning, I think we can keep him alive. So I was able to do that. Kim Dae-jung was tied hand and foot in a boat in the Straits of Tsushima, waiting to be thrown into the sea. And it had, he'd been kidnapped by the Korean CIA because he had almost beaten President Park Chung-hee in an election. And uh, they very much feared him as an opponent. So. I took the information back to Phil Habib. And when I get to this part of the story and I'm teaching a class at a college or talking to a class, I ask the students, now, what do you do with this information? How do you present it to the autocratic, egocentric, dictatorial president of Korea, saying the second most powerful man in South Korea, Lee Hoo Rock, to whom you are very careful, close, has just kidnapped and plans to kill your main political opponent. Now, how do you choose to deliver that message to somebody like Park Chung-hee? And it deserves some thought. And uh, so I give my students two options. One, get in your car, fly the flag, turn on the, sir the, the siren, go up and say, Mr. You know, hold the horses, save Kim Dae-jung. Uh, or do you send him a note and say, I've got something to tell you. This is what's happened to Kim Dae-jung. I want to come and talk to you about it in an hour. Now, would you want to take a test? Probably not. <laughs> you want to share the answer? <laughs> well, Habib sent him a note. And I think that was absolutely the right thing to do. Because uh, we later learned that President Park had ordered that Kim Dae-jung be kidnapped and killed. And uh, so it was a very difficult thing for him to deal with. And so at the end of the hour, when Habib came up, he came forward and said, thank you. Goodness, you were able to tell me this. And to have had that happen would have been the worst possible thing I can imagine. I can't thank you enough. 
and we have taken steps and Kim Dae-jung is safe. This was by the man who'd ordered him kidnapped and killed. So the word got out uh, in South Korea that uh, KCIA had, had done this, and the word was, uh, it was a rogue element in KCIA that had done this. And when this word spread on college campuses in Korea, there were riots, as the Koreans are very inflammatory people. And Korean CIA went on to Seoul National University's campus, arrested an American-trained Lincoln scholar, accused him of having started the riots, and either tortured him to death or tortured him to the point where he jumped out a window to escape further agony. And we knew exactly what had happened, and I reported it. And I then sent a follow-up message saying, I want to protest this. And the answer from headquarters was, stop trying to save the Koreans from themselves. That is not your job. You just report the facts. So I stewed about that. And uh, I finally broke the rules. I went to the chief bodyguard of the president of, of South Korea. And I said, uh, Mr. Park, you know what happened to Professor Che? I know what happened to Professor Che. This is unworthy of your country in terms of what it hopes to become as a civilized part of the Western world. And I said, I haven't any authority to say this, but I just want to tell you it makes me feel lousy that I have to deal with an organization that does that kind of thing. I said, this is not an official statement. I'm just telling you what my kibun is, that's a Korean word, what my deep feeling is. He thanked me. Uh, a week later, the uh, head of KCIA was fired. Uh, he went into hiding, uh, was brought back, put into jail. Uh, his replacement was a former justice minister uh, whose first act was a prohibition against torture. Now, the other question I ask my students is, do you think I told CIA what I had done? And the answer is? No. <laughs> <laughs> and I figured that the man whose orders I had disobeyed knew me, he disliked me, and he would have loved to have used that as a way of bringing me down, except that the director of the agency was also a, new, a man I knew, Bill Colby. So I thought, okay, what if I, uh, what if I do say what I did? Uh, well, my opponent would take it to Colby and said, well, that SOB Greg uh, disobeyed my orders, and this is what he did. And then Colby would say, well, what happened as a result of that? And uh, he would say, well, that sounds pretty good. And so my opponent wouldn't have wanted to be in that position, so he wouldn't have said anything. I think he knew what I had done. So I said nothing until I finished my tour as ambassador. And CIA then approached me and said, you have a lot of experience uh, melding policy with intelligence, and we'd like to have you make a series of talks to the top operators in CIA. And so I said, I will do it on one condition, and that is that I tell them in full detail how I broke the rules and advise them to do the same. And so they said, OK. And so I made about five talks to very senior people and told them exactly what I told you. And when I think back to the things that I did in the agency, uh, that stands head and shoulders above uh, higher than almost anything else. Because an awful lot of intelligence work, there aren't very many happy endings in intelligence work. You're trying to tell truth to power when power does not want to hear the truth. Uh, and you're often in a very uncomfortable position. I still am in an uncomfortable position on the way I feel about things in North Korea. We can get into that if you wish. But I think it's very important to say to young people, uh, no matter what they go into, uh, 
that if they are asked to do something or become a part of something which would cause them to define themselves differently or would cause them to define the organization which had asked them to do this thing differently, think carefully. Do you want to become a part of that? How many times can you give in to that kind of thing without changing yourself? And it's a hard road to hoe, but I think it's worth pointing out. Um, so uh, how did you move from uh, the CIA to the National Security Council? Uh, when Jimmy Carter was elected president, he brought in a man named Stanfield Turner, who was a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, he also spent some time at Amherst as, as a Williams man. That's a fatal mistake. Uh, and he was one who felt that the thing that got you in trouble uh, in CIA was human intelligence. And it was much more important to be able to do things electronically or sonically. And so he put a great deal of effort into satellites, SIGINT, listening, watching, and there was a diminu diminution of the kind of human intelligence operations that I had been involved in. He didn't fire me, but he did fire about 600 of our best case officers. And he kept me from getting a much two or three much higher positions in the agency for which I was nominated. And I knew why my bolt was shot uh, when somebody uh, working for Brzezinski at the uh, NSC under Jimmy Carter left. Uh, somebody mentioned my name. I went down to Brzezinski. He hired me, and uh, I started a 10-year run at the White House. Okay. How, how did you become the National Security Advisor to Vice President Bush, and, and what did you do in that role? The first vice president to have a National Security Advisor uh, was Mondale under Carter. Okay. It was a new position. And uh, the f first person that... George H.W. Bush put into the job as a woman. And uh, I was on the National Security Council staff in charge of intelligence and East Asian affairs. And he took a long, long trip to Asia as vice president. And I went along, as was the customary thing, representing the National Security Council staff. And there were various extremely contentious issues that came up on that trip. Chief among them was, uh, should he go to China? Uh, and should he face, try to face down the Chinese in terms of the Taiwan Relations Act, which had been placed, uh, by, passed by Congress, which the Chinese uh, disliked intensely? I urged him to go, and he did go and did a marvelous job in dealing with Huang Hua, the very experienced Chinese foreign minister, and really set the stage for good relations with China over the next decade. And at the end of that trip, I was offered the job. The, my predecessor was let go, and I moved into the space. That's really all I can say. Yeah. What, was, what did you do in the job, day to day? I mean, what did your average day look like? The, I tried to prepare him. I, tr I tried to know what was on the president's agenda. I tried to know what kind of meetings were scheduled that would involve foreign policy in which the vice president would have an interest. I would try to get my hands on the contending views that would be brought to a head in that kind of meeting and brief him on those kinds of meetings before they took place. The, the key, I think, to the effectiveness of that was the fact that he and Reagan got along extremely well. Uh, I've written a book, a memoir, and in that part of dealing with what I did in the White House, I say that Bush was the rudder under the Reagan sailboat. They got along extremely well. Uh, Bush had, I was with Bush when we first met Gorbachev at the Chernyanko funeral. We wrote a memo back to Reagan saying this is a man with whom we can end the Cold War. And I think that Bush was instrumental in getting Reagan to meet four times with Gorbachev during Reagan's 
fourth or second term. And that set the stage for the meeting between Bush and Gorbachev, which took place on Malta. And I have heard Gorbachev say personally that was the end of the Cold War. And so uh, it was an interesting job because Bush was extremely loyal. He liked Reagan immensely. They had a once a week, one on one meeting for which I worked very hard in terms of presenting an, an agenda. But I got very little feedback from Bush in terms of, well, I told Ronnie this, and boy, I think that's really going to change. Absolutely none of that. What he said to Reagan stayed with Reagan. And as I got to know Bush better and the years passed, I would get some indications of the degree of empathy that they had and the degree of influence which Bush had. Uh, there's a long Bush uh, article or book out on Bush now by John Meacham, and he doesn't deal with that at all. He deals with uh, Bush as president, not Bush as vice president. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you sat in, in your role as national security advisor to the vice president and in, in your, in your uh, regional role with the National Security Council. You were part of the National Security Council. How? For those of us who don't know, how is the NSC organized and um, you know, exactly what is its responsibility? Well, it has grown over, over time and what you have there is uh, a replica, a small replica of the larger governmental foreign policy establishment. So you have a man in the, or a woman in the NSC who covers foreign policy in Latin America, and he deals with the Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs. When I was in that, I, I dealt with uh, Dick Holbrook, a marvelous foreign service officer whose loss we all regret, uh, who was uh, Assistant Secretary for East Asia. So it was a way of uh, when the, the bell rings and a problem arises, the people in the larger bureaucracy, who usually will pick up first rumors of a problem, will know exactly who to go to in the White House. And there will be established relations and channels set so that if something needs to get through to the top level quickly, it can be done. Because it is done by people who know each other, meet with each other frequently, and trust each other. Okay. You mentioned the, the episode, the, the initial meeting with uh, uh, General Secretary Gorbachev. What are some of the other efforts that you were involved in when you worked with Vice President Bush and some of the conflicts that, that you were responsible for briefing him on and getting him up to speed? One of his most successful uh, maneuvers was in making a trip to Europe and getting the Europeans to deploy what we call the INF, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Weapon, which would have been a countermeasure to the SS-20, which the Soviets were planning to deploy. Uh, this was a very difficult uh, mission because uh, there were strong feelings about it, pro and con, in the government and within Europe. And this trip that he made uh, was tremendously successful. Uh, he, he got the Italians, the Germans, the French, and the Dutch all to say they would deploy the INF, which led to, I think, the Soviets realizing that the, to counterbalance that was something beyond which they couldn't do. But it caused us to be attacked, our convoy to be attacked by terrorists along the way. Uh, but he handled it, uh, I think, uh, extremely, extremely well. Uh, I think that he, he was very good at keeping out, out of trouble. The Iran-Contra issue, which uh, I, I was involved in, uh, was very painful for, for Reagan. Uh, and it, it is an illustration to me of an organization that, like the White House, that is dealing with so many things, 
but where there is suddenly an overarching issue like Iran-Contra, or for Carter, the hostages in, in Iran. Uh, it just sucks the life out of the entire White House because everybody is covering themselves and seeing how do I look and how is this going to play out and who's going to say what in the, in the press. And uh, I think that, that Bush was, was very good in, in, in dealing with that. He was uh, very, very loyal and uh, was a, just an extremely honorable man to, to deal with. I went to 65 countries with him and I saw him deal with everybody from Robert Mugabe, whom he immediately spotted as a rising horror, uh, to Margaret Thatcher, uh, to Ernest Kohl in Germany. We met the emperor in Japan. Uh, and his judge of people uh, was extraordinary. His ability to, to establish rapport with them was amazing. He also, one of the things that very few people know about with Bush was that he was director of CIA for one year. And that period is regarded by the agency as its very short golden era. And why is that? It was because he understood the intelligence business and he defended the agency from having to do things which were alien to our basic nature as a country. And the agency really worshipped him for that. And uh, the agency had him out there uh, two or three week, months ago. I was invited. I couldn't, I couldn't go. Uh, they said it was very, very emotional. I went with him uh, shortly after I became his national security advisor. Uh, I was well known at the agency, having worked there for 31 years. And it was uh, extremely emotional to see he was absolutely cheered to the echo. And uh, on the way back to the White House, he wept. And he said, uh, that is the best job I ever had. And whenever it was possible for him, when we went abroad, he would try to call on the chief of station and talk with, with that person. And if he couldn't do it, he would have me do it. And so he, he constantly did the, the extra thing. Uh, he was very generous, uh, never backbiting, never undercutting people. And uh, I just found him the, the most delightful, honorable man I can possibly imagine. I'm going to make kind of a leap now because we have a lot of ground to cover and uh, our folks here will get a chance to ask you a few questions Please. a little bit later, but let's go forward to serving as um, the U.S. Ambassador to South Korea. How did that come about? Uh, well, I'd served there as Chief of Station and uh, the my involvement in the, uh, I'm being very honest here, and it's uncomfortable for me to say this, but I'm, you know, so what? Uh, I think the natural thing would have been for me to have become his national security advisor when he became president. That did not happen because there were some people around him who felt that because of my involvement in Iran-Contra uh, that I had somehow undercut his ability to perhaps to be elected or his perhaps his ability to be president. And so he called me in and said, Don, I just can't do this. But he said, I'd like to make you ambassador to South Korea. And I said, that's fine. And I understood it. And he took Brent Scowcroft, who couldn't have done a better job. Uh, but that's how I got the job. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a fascinating one uh, because I had served there as chief of station. 1973 to 75, and that very rarely happens. And so I had the perspective of knowing what South Korea was doing in 73 to 75, uh, and then again seeing what it was doing when I came back as ambassador in 1989, and the difference was tremendous. And so the problems that we faced when I became ambassador 
The one that I immediately saw was the fact that we still had nuclear weapons in South Korea. And we were beginning to lean on the North Koreans to get them to stop developing nuclear weapons of their own. And we had an annual inspection of our nuclear weapons to make sure that there were no accidental explosions. There had been one in Spain and that it had been a disaster. And so this inspection coincided with my arrival in, in Seoul, and so I asked to see the team leader as he left. And uh, he said, everything is beautiful, Mr. Ambassador, there are going to be no accidents. And I said, well, tell me, what kind of weapons do we have here? And then he said, well, you know, we have various things that can be dropped from planes. Uh, and you have still the uh, Honest John ground-to-ground -ground rocket. I said, oh, tell me about that. He said, well, it's a nuclear warhead with a 15-mile range. Think about that. 15-mile range. So I went to our four-star general, a guy named Lou Menetry, and I said, Lou, why do we have Honest John rockets here? He said, oh, we've always had them. I said, well, would you use them? <laughs> he said, absolutely not. I said, well, then, you know, aren't you aware that we're going to tell the North Koreans not to do this? And the first thing they will say is, we're, of course, we're going to do it because you've already done it. Well, he got the point. Uh, I next went to the president of, of South Korea, a man named No Tae-woo, who had a national security advisor, an American-trained Korean with a PhD, who was marvelous. And I put the same question to him. And so after a year, I was able to send a message to Washington saying, with the full support of the commander of forces and the UN forces in, in Korea and the full support of the president of South Korea, we recommend that our nuclear weapons be withdrawn from South Korea. And a year later, we could neither confirm or deny. Our standard policy was we neither confirm or deny whether we have any nuclear weapons. So we would never say we have them and we took them out. So it was arranged that we would remove them and that we had arranged to have the president of, of uh, South Korea saying, I am confident that the United States has removed its nuclear weapons from South Korea. And uh, when I was asked about that, I would say, well, I certainly am not going to contradict the president of South Korea. So they were out. And we then went ahead and canceled for a year a massive training uh, exercise called Team Spirit, which was a reenactment of our involvement in the Korean War in 1950. And it drove the North Koreans absolutely crazy because they thought we were going to uh, let slip the, the same thing. And by canceling that operation for one year, uh, there were six prime ministerial meetings between North and South Korea and two agreements reached which are still cornerstones of, uh, or high watermarks of the North-South uh, Korean relationship. And just before I left uh, Korea as ambassador, it was announced that the Pentagon had reestablished Team Spirit. That was the doing of Dick Cheney, who had never uh, told me or told the State Department that he was going to order the operation, uh, the training operation reinstated. The North Koreans immediately withdrew from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and a nuclear crisis developed in, 2000, in 1994 that took Jimmy Carter to visit to North Korea to avoid a very, very dangerous time. So the, the job in North Korea and the job in, in, in Seoul as ambassador is one of the most interesting jobs in, in the world, and I, I loved it. Uh, I've been to North Korea six times, uh, and uh, I meet regularly with the North Koreans, uh, and uh, it's a problem we, we need to do better on. Uh, 
Uh, they are threatening us. They are increasing the range of their nuclear weapons. They are increasing the accuracy, but they still can't reach the United States. And even if they could hit one, hit one of our cities, they are not lunatics. They are not going to do that because they know if they did, we would obliterate their country. But it is a deterrent. And uh, we have had a policy of what we call strategic patience, uh, where we won't talk to them except if we get them to say, OK, we'll talk about denuclearization as the opening entry to talks. And the North Koreans won't do that. Uh, I was at a meeting with the North Koreans uh, last week. And uh, the Korean, North Korean ambassador was asked a very good question by an American scholar. Uh, what do you think when you see the United States reaching out to Cuba? And he said, well, I didn't expect to be asked that question. But uh, here's my answer. He said, in Cuba, you've done two things. You've recognized that your policy of embargo wasn't working, hadn't been working for a long time. And you decided to re recognize the fact that Cuba is essentially a different country than, you are, than yours with uh, a different system. And you're not asking them to give that up. And you agreed to talk with no conditions. And he said, that's something you're not willing to do with us. And until you do, we're not going to get very far. OK. There is a, a film that I had not heard of that you told me about called American Umpire, which will be uh, coming out on basically the role of the war of the U.S. as world policeman. Is that the U.S.'s role in today's uh, foreign policy? Should it be? Well, it is. And I think it's, there's an article which I mentioned to you by Tom Friedman yesterday talking about another book written by a guy named Mandelbaum uh, talking about the failures uh, of American policy where we try to not only keep a country from doing what we don't like, we also reach inside and try to change the nature of the way it does business. And I think that started with the Dulles Brothers. Uh, and I saw it in action in the 1950s, uh, where we overthrew Mossadegh, Mossadegh in Iran, because he nationalized uh, oil. Uh, and uh, we next uh, overthrew somebody in Guatemala and put a man in place that was just a butcher. And our third effort was in Cuba, which failed. But we seem to feel that uh, it's our duty not only to keep countries from doing things that we object to, we need to sort of make them behave more as we would behave. And to try to bring change about by doing that. And that doesn't work. I cannot name a single country where that has worked. I think that hardline countries change when they find it to be in their interest to change. That was the value of Nixon and Kissinger going to China. That was the value of George Herbert Walker Bush recognizing what Gorbachev <coughs> represented. It was his wise decision not to dance on the Berlin Wall when it went, went down. It was the more sophisticated view of, OK, we don't like what you're doing to your people. You've got awful jails. Uh, our jails aren't the greatest in the world either. Uh, you need to change it. We need to change it. Uh, but what, what, what needs to happen to get at this? Um, I had a very interesting conversation with a woman who's head of economic development for the UN in Latin America. And she said, at the UN, the human rights people and the economic development people hate each other. Because I, as an economic development person, say the, the way to get a country 
to change the way it treats its people for the better is to have them help their economic development and give their people a fairer share of life. And we have terrible fights with the human rights people who say, no, 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 you've got to, you know, you've got to get them to change the way they deal with their prisons. You know, it's just terrible, I mean, what they're doing. I saw that in action when I took the North Korean ambassador to the Council on Foreign Relations to speak on the record on human rights in North Korea. Now, there's a charming assignment for you. <laughs> and he was chivied and badgered by the human rights groups at the Council on Foreign Relations who didn't want to hear what he had to say. And they said, who, who sent you here? You know, how dare you come here? Who do you think you are? What are you trying to accomplish? That kind of thing. And I said, well, you asked me to come and talk about our, our prison system and uh, we're trying to change it for, for the better, so forth. So I took him out to dinner later and I, <coughs> congratulated him for keeping his cool. And he said, well, I had, to, I had to say what my government had told me to say. And I said, well, what would you have said if it had been off the record? And he said, well, I would have said, we in the foreign ministry of North Korea find it very difficult to talk directly to people who run our prison system. Not a bad comment. Might work in this country. I have... Uh one final question, then we're going to open it up to your uh, questions and answers. I hope some of you asked some of the questions I have that I didn't have time to get to tonight. So, my last question uh, for you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, is you know, you're very much still an astute student of what's going on in the world. What would you view as America's biggest looming national security or diplomatic challenges? A couple of them. <coughs> Highlight them for us. China and international terrorism. Could you amplify a little bit on each one? Uh, I think our challenge with, with terrorism uh, is to keep the thinking dispassionately about what it represents and not getting absolutely blown away when the inevitable things happen and a terrorist gets lucky. We are very, very fortunate that the New York Police Department is probably one of the best anti-terrorist groups in the world. We've been very lucky. We may not always be lucky. I think what I find very difficult to understand is the way we shake off a tragedy like the shooting at Newtown, the kids in Connecticut. What, 21 youngsters shot? And uh, do we do anything in response to that? No. Now, if it had been the terrorists that had gone in and shot those 21 kids, what would we do? All kinds of officials would be fired. Our whole approach to dealing with terrorism would be called into question. So, you know, we, we need to keep thinking hard about how we react to these issues, some of which are going to happen. I happen to think, uh, there's a film I, my wife and I saw a couple of days ago called Eye in the Sky that I rec recommend to all of you. It is the best depiction I've ever seen of drone warfare and the moral dilemmas that drone warfare rises up, causes. But I think it's the way to go rather than the 82nd Airborne leaping out of planes by the tens of thousands. I have a grandson who's just finished ranger training. And he's now at the tip of the spear. He's going to be in one of the four ranger battalions that is ready to go 24-7 anywhere. And that's what he wants to do. The most dangerous military job I can think of and the toughest training to get there, and he rejoices in doing it. 
but it's an individual commitment. I'm very, very proud of them. So these are difficult days. China uh, has got all kinds of difficulties. Uh, they're very tough to deal with on territorial issues, and this problem we have with the little islands in the South China Sea are, are major. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, Obama keep working with Xi, uh, but I think that uh, the nature of our relationship with China is extremely important, and we have a long way to go before we can view it as anything but a very fragile and very dangerous problem. Okay. We're going to open it up to Q&A. If you've got a question, raise your hand. Try to get the eye of one of our students here. And uh... Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm a professor in the Department of History, and right now I'm teaching the Korean War. So if you're going to hang around to Monday, we sure would love to have you in classroom. <laughs> it, would, uh, it would be great. I've uh, taken lots of notes, and I'll use some of this on Monday if you can't show up. But you are invited to, uh, to our classroom. Uh, the, uh, the question I had is that, um, when we discuss these, what are the major threats facing the United States uh, currently? I, uh, I I always put uh, Kim Jong Un at the uh, at the top of that, and just because I think he is uh, not a rational actor, and so I wondered if you could comment on uh, your thoughts on Kim Jong Un. Thank you. The the jury certainly is is out. Uh, on, on Kim Jong-un. Uh, I call North Korea the longest running failure in the history of American intelligence. And I have used that phrase in, in my trips to North Korea because it's, it's amazing that we know as little as we do about him. Uh, when he first showed up uh, while his father was still alive, uh, I wrote Joe Biden, the vice president, and said, here's a young man educated in part in Switzerland, speaks some English, basketball, not great fan of the Chicago Bulls, but that's about all we know about him. How about inviting him for an orientation tour in the United States? Uh, we learn a lot about him. If we make the offer, the North Koreans may well turn it down, but they would never forget the fact that the offer was made. And it was turned down because the, uh, the voice was, oh, the, uh, the opposition would just uh, riot, run us out of town or riot, riot, uh, rail if we did something like that. I think it was a, an opportunity we missed. Um, I had a chance to sit with the Austral Australian chairman of the UN Commission on Human Rights in North Korea, which was submitted to the UN uh, and has caused a great deal of sturm and drang. And he's a very good guy. And I said, your report covers a long period of time. And the record is awful. Have you seen any fluctuations in the severity of the way things are being done? And he said, yes, it has become less severe under Kim Jong-un. Now, he didn't say that till I asked him. I've never heard it repeated, but that's what he said when I asked him. And what I tell my human rights friends, uh, they don't like that at all. They say, I think he must have misunderstood your question. Um, he is doing a lot to make life easier for his people. Uh, I, and he's very sophisticated. He's much more sophisticated than we give him credit for. I went to a, a very suave party, ballet, uh, favor, or supporting the U.S., or the New York City Ballet, a billionaire American, married to a Russian woman, a good friend of mine. I showed up. She came rushing over to me and said, John. I've just spent five days in Pyongyang. Said, what the hell were you doing there? <laughs> and she said, well, 
My, the North Koreans invited my husband. And I said, well, they clearly like him to investigate. Oh, yeah, but he didn't. They don't know how to handle investments. But I said, well, what did you think of it? She's a Russian. And she said, well, I didn't like, I had a minder all the time. I didn't like that at all. But, she said, uh, Pyongyang is emerging as a modern city. Uh, she's very stylish herself. She said, I went into a couple of stores. I noticed what women were wearing. I noticed what the perfumes they were wearing. I went into some restaurants and saw the food that was being served there. And this, the city is, is, is beautiful. And she said, then, of course, uh, there was the endless goose-stepping parade with the tanks. And she said, it's just, she used a vulgar word. Uh, she said, it's the same kind of BS that the Soviet Union used to try to do. So here is, you get fragments. Uh, so I don't think he's a nutcase. Uh, I think he is onto something in terms of making his nuclear deterrent stronger and stronger, and that's why I think we need to take heed to the messages we're getting from them saying what we want is a peace regime that would be a substitute for the armistice agreement of 1953. And I think it is in our interest to work toward that. Uh, now, he may turn out we don't know enough about him. I'm just telling you what I think about him from what little I've been able to accumu accumulate in terms of information. Okay, I have a question right here. Okay, hi, I've, I'm a student. I uh, am really excited to have you here. It's been a really awesome talk tonight. Uh, you spoke earlier about the role of human intelligence in your actions and in the collection of national intelligence in the past and seeing the current focus on technology and data collection nowadays, what do you see in the value of human capital and hum in human intelligence going to the future like and also now? What was the last sentence you used? What do you see as the role of human intelligence and human capital in uh, national security and national intelligence going into the future? I think there is really no substitute for the value of, of well-placed human sources. And one of the, this will amuse you, I'm going to cite a, a book called Our Man in Charleston by Christopher Dickey. Uh, and it's written about a British consul uh, who served in Charleston from 1853 to 1863 at a time where the South was producing more cotton to satisfy Britain's demand than could be handled by the number of slaves they had in the South. And so the illegal deliverance of slaves was started. And the British consul pretended to be completely comfortable with all of that and reported in detail to the UK what was going on in Charleston, including the bringing in to Charleston of a slave ship that had been intercepted by the Union forces because it was breaking the rules, and his description of that was unbelievable. And so his reporting and the impact of that on Palmerston, uh, Christopher Dickey says, was the pivotal point in keeping the UK from extending diplomatic recognition to the Confederacy which would have changed the ball game entirely in terms of the war between the states. Uh, and that is the value uh, of a human source. Uh, Kim Philby, probably the most famous and most effective Western spy that ever lived, betrayed hundreds of American and British agents uh, by his actions. Uh, including a, a Russian GRU general whom I dealt with in Burma, giving us fabulous information, who was betrayed, taken out of his dhaka, and shot. So the, the, the well-placed human source is absolutely priceless, but they're hard to come by. But they are very much worth 
pursuing. As I say to the North Koreans, I wish I knew more about you, because it's, it, I, I'm not, I don't, because we've never really been able to recruit any of you. <laughs> and that's true. Uh, and we, the kind of talk I have with, with the ambassador in, in New York, and he knows my background, they used to drop leaflets denouncing me when I was ambassador. So they have no question about who I am. But I'm extremely careful never to dip in, dip my toe back into the intelligence water. And I make clear to them what we need is the better ability to talk rationally and honestly with each other. And I think that can be brought into, into play if we begin to come talk about a peace regime to take the place of the armistice agreement. Okay, we have a question here. Of the Iran nuclear agreement, and, I think second, it, and secondly, uh -oh. your assessment of Brzezinski. Of Brzezinski. Zbig? Yes. Okay. Uh, I like Zbig a lot. He, very hostile to the Soviets, never forgot that he was a Pole, <laughs> thought that the Pope, the Polish Pope, was one of the great people on the face of the earth. Uh, I think he's kept his mind in good shape, and I'm still very respectful of what he, uh, of what he writes and uh, what he says. Uh, I think that uh, the agreement with Iran is one of the most important things that uh, Obama will have accomplished as president. And I think we have to remind ourselves that when you reach out to a country that has been our enemy, it's important to remember why it has been our enemy. And we have a tendency to forget inconvenient facts, such as the fact that we overthrew Mossadegh in uh, 1951. The Iranians will never forget that, ever. We also need that the fact that you make an agreement with an enemy country on one facet of our relations, that is not a deus ex machina that clears everything up. You've still got tremendous other problems to deal with in other facets of the relationship, but it's a place to start. And uh, I think of, of all the things that Obama has done diplomatically, I would rate that as number one. Okay, we have a, another question back here. So one of the East Asian security topics I run into the most op often, alongside our best pal Kim Jong-un, is the territorial disputes that the People's Republic of China has with all the other East Asian nations and us. So I was wondering how you see that being resolved, or if you do see that being resolved. I don't have a clue. <laughs> I think it's one of the most difficult problems we solve. We need to keep working at it, but I do not have any bright words to commit, and I'd be absolutely faking it if I came up with something off the top of my head. Sorry. OK, we have time for a, OK, good. Got one right here. Somebody had their hand up right up front here, too. So we get at least a couple more, maybe a few more. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, would you comment briefly on the presidential race and also <laughs> uh, specifically on uh, one of the candidates who would like to allow Japan and South Korea uh, to nuclear arm as well as Saudi Arabia? given what you said tonight about all of those uh, nuclear issues? Thank you. Um, <laughs> the last thing my wor wife said to me this morning was don't get involved in pol politics. <laughs> 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 so let me put it this way. Uh, I think one of our great successes in Asia has been the fact that neither South Korea nor Japan have gone nuclear. I think it is extremely important to keep them from going nuclear. 
I was struck by the fact that John Kerry said much the same thing uh, the other day. Uh, I think that that uh, assertion by this man who shall be nameless is, is just evidence of a very shallow and in many ways misguided approach to the issues that we, that we face. And uh, I think nonproliferation is something we need to continue to hold the line on. And I think it's imperative that we continue to hold the line on, on Japan and, and uh, South Korea. Okay, we have another question back here. Okay. Me again. <laughs> Oh yeah, I wonder if you could uh, comment on uh, Brent Skokoff uh, as the advisor to uh, Bush, and then and then maybe uh, just a little bit more on him when he uh, when George W. Bush was uh, making decisions. Uh, Brent Skokoff had a number of comments about that also. I, won I wonder if you. I'm just sorry. Who's the first man you're talking about? Uh, Brent uh, Brent Skokoff. Oh, Brent Skokoff. The, right, the uh, sorry, national security advisor to yeah. uh, Bush, and then. But he, uh, he had other comments to say uh, when George W. Bush uh, was making decisions also. Well, I'm, Brent to me is ex extremely sound. I mean, I just, I don't, I can't relate to specific things he, he said, but I think he's very responsible. I think he did a mar marvelous job with Bush. I think their decision not to go into Iraq, not to slaughter the retreating Iraqi army was, was the correct one. And uh, I think his, uh, his record will stand uh, on the right side of history uh, permanently. So I'm, I'm very, very impressed with him. I like him and admire him. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. That was terrific. Thank you. All right.